Thank you. <laughs> My name is Dorothy Santos. I'm a writer, editor, curator. I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm going to share some book projects, as the title suggests, that are and derive from both digital and imagined spaces. So I had the privilege of working on and researching artists this past couple of years that have used small press publications and the book format to supplement digital and new media art practices. And the works I'm sharing with you today, I feel are great examples of how artists are translating from within the digital realm and imagine and speculative places to, to the physical, to book format and even into performance. These artists are pulling from a wide array of disciplines to further interrogate and expand what art means, what it can be, and how small press can serve as a mediation between digital and analog. So let's start off with the artist Carla Gannis and her selfie drawings. So a few things to note about Gannis is that she's a classically trained painter. And this particular project that I'm going to show you was inspired by Joseph Kosuth's 1966 neon sculpture, A Subject Self-Defined. For anyone who's interested, it really is a neon sculpture that just says A Subject Self-Defined, very self-referential. Gannis has stated, uh, quote, Kasuth belongs to a group of artists involved in stripping down the art object, reducing it to the ideas and information that were detached from personal meaning. 49 years later, when we find art in the age of networked identity and digital dematerialization, I'm perplexed by the subjecthood and self-definition in relationship to the personal when performed publicly, end quote. By taking the selfie to places that remove, well, in essence, she's removing herself from her specific reality and into the realm of popular culture or within an art historical reference, Gannis is actually recontextualizing her subjecthood and her likeness. So to break down her project, in 2015, once a week, she did digital selfie drawings. And in 2016, which we're still in, and as probably as I speak, she's probably working on an augment right now. She's producing an augment uh, once a week, a digital selfie augment that will pair with each drawing in the book. So here's the book. Uh, it provides the viewer with vantage points that traverse various forms of self-portraiture, creative methodologies. Her series converges on a wide array of technologies that include drawing, painting, social media, and augmented reality. And there's a deliberate nature in each selfie drawing. Uh, she shows specific, a specific trajectory and intent as well as an evolution of against herself and um, through this two year long meditation. So I wanted to show uh, what it looks like. I'm pretty sure most people know uh, augmented reality, but I, I definitely wanted to, to show what the book and the actual augment look like. And this is selfie drawing 34, it's Lorem Ipsum. It was done in June, 2015. And the next two slides, I wanted to show everyone what an actual drawing looks like in the book, so a, a bit more close up. And then to your right, it's going to be the augment. So here's selfie drawing 50, and it's Teresa with Angel, and that was done in November 2015. And um, it's pretty iconic, but it is Bernini's ecstasy, kind of an, uh, an, a nod to Bernini's ecstasy of St. Teresa, but instead of kind of God's love, it's, you know, what's pretty much a trope of kind of contemporary culture, which is emojis uh, hitting the hearts of Carla Gannis. And here's another one. It's selfie drawing 48, abstraction, done in October 2015, and the accompanying augment. And as you can see here, it's Gannis herself, very much fragmented with all of these uh, selfies of different body parts. And then uh, the actual drawing is of, you know, depicting kind of the selfie stick phenomena. So moving on to a different type of artist book is the collaboration between artists Morrison Aliotti and writer Daniel O'Rourke. So this project stemmed from both Aliotti and O'Rourke's fascination with additive manufacturing, or commonly known as 3D printing. The word additivism, and this probably seems obvious, but again, I just want to point it out, is a portmanteau for the words additive and activism. So Aliari's artwork and O'Rourke's writing resulted in the creation of an additivist manifesto. And I'm going to show you uh, 30, about 30 seconds of the video shortly. And subsequently, after that manifesto, they decided we wanted to do a 3D additivist cookbook, which I understand is both commentary and emblematic of the possibilities of and the absurdity um, of 3D printing, essentially. So a source of the inspiration for the cookbook, as you see here, was uh, uh, is William Powell's 
the Anarchist Cookbook, which was written at the height of the counterculture movement during the Vietnam War. And for those of you not familiar, it included instructions on how to make explosives, illegal substances, and phone fracking. It's actually a really difficult book to get now, um, at, well, at least according to my research, unless anyone knows otherwise. So I will show you about 30, 30 seconds of this. Derived from petrochemicals boiled into being from the black oil of a trillion ancient bacteriomes. The plastic used in 3D additive manufacturing is a metaphor before it has even been laid into shape. Its potential belies the complications of its history. That matter is the sum and prolongation of our ancestry. That creativity is brutal sensual, rude, coarse, and cruel. All right, that's very light for the morning. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I think the reason why I wanted to show a video is because, you know, when I spoke with Aliati about the project, she and O'Rourke felt that they wanted to change this idea of the manifesto. Um, you know, when you think about a manifesto, it's typically in a book, it's a broadside, it's, it's very, uh, text, there's a textuality and a kind of physicality to it. And they wanted to create a video that actually shows what 3D printing is all about. I mean, it's really about the 3D modeling that occurs in the digital, in the digital space. And so they created this video. Um, and you can read the entire manifesto online, I really highly recommend it, but not only just reading it, I really, really recommend watching the video. It's about 10 minutes long, uh, and y but really, you, yeah, just take the time to read, to, to read the manifesto and watch the video. But I also wanna point out the brilliant sound design by Andrea Young, which you can kind of listen to on your own. And if you think about it, I, I, I feel the 30 seconds I did give you, you can actually hear it resembles a 3D printer. And um, there's kind of an ebb and flow to that throughout the video. So subsequently after the manifesto, that, that was penned by Aliati and O'Rourke, you know, and to kind of point out, and you'll notice, they pull from other manifestos as well. But they didn't want to stop there, as I mentioned. They wanted to do a cookbook. They were curious about how others would understand and reinterpret the manifesto, and they invited artists and writers and other cultural producers to see how they were looking at and working through this concept of additivism. So here's a shot of the same video. It's uh, much more later down the line. Uh, and before I move on to the next project, I wanted to share a statement given by O'Rourke during an interview conducted by multidisciplinary artist and writer Greta Lowe. I think it really sums up what additivism is for both uh, Aliati and O'Rourke. Additivism, quote, additivism is an attempt to play out that promise and see what new possibilities and contradictions are produced across social, material, political, and infrastructural spectrums. A hundred years from now, how will contemporary technologies become metaphors in patterns of thought and language? Additivism, as a conceit, buys into that question based on what a 3D printer does, taking something small and building up layer by layer. Additivism is about scaling up small gestures to their planetary consequences. And I, I do want to say that I'm, I was under, um, I, I, I made a promise to to um, Aliadi, to Morshin, uh, that I wouldn't show screenshots of the, of the book that's under, you know, under guard right now. Uh, it is going to be released in December. I highly recommend looking at that book as well. It's huge. It's a tremendous collection, as I mentioned, from artists and writers and people making in 3D printing or people just speculating on it. And it's actually going to be free, um, so you can print it yourself uh, when, it's, when it's available. So the next project uh, is by Liat Bordugo and Alaya Vargas, and it is issue one. I'm, I'm going to focus on issue one. They, they too are also coming up with a cookbook, but uh, today I'm going to present issue one of the Living Room Light Exchange. And the reason why this particular project, I wanted to talk about it today, is it wasn't originally envisioned as a publication. They did not want documentation of these uh, light exchanges. And it all started about two years ago when Bordugo and Vargas co-founded monthly salons called the Living Room Light Exchange. And uh, just something to point out, uh, across the Bay Area, Gracious Hosts donated their living rooms for an evening to host these monthly conversations on new media, digital art, creative works, uh, works in progress, artistic practices, um, even involving performances as well. The, art, the events uh, were and are open to the public and attended by both friends and strangers. The aim was to produce a meaningful conversation they felt was lacking in more formal spaces such 
as cultural institutions, museums, galleries, and art centers. And before I show you photos of the actual exchange, I know they said no videotaping, but these, these are actually by uh, Bardugo herself. Um, there's an unspoken rule at these light exchanges, uh, or kind of uh, an etiquette, where guests refrain from videotaping, documenting, and even actively posting on social media. And I think that's in large part due to the nature of the space. It's a living room. So even though a living room is meant for entertaining, to a certain extent, it's still private. Um, so again, the photos I'm about to show you are from Verdugo herself. There, it's really dark, so I apologize for that. I wasn't anticipating this. Um, and if you do want to see the presentation, I'm more than willing to share it. Uh, but it, this is uh, supposed to be of cultural historian Megan Prelinger and uh, the Prelinger Library Artist in Residence, Lindsay Dupler. And then here is one, again, very dark, I apologize, of writer and artist uh, Joe Vikes and his presentation with, um, he actually spoke the same night as Pamela Z, who's a composer and she's based out of Stanford. And this was in Oakland. I don't think I mentioned the last one. The last uh, picture I showed was in San Francisco and this took place last year as well in November. But something else I wanted to point out that's very interesting about the Living Room Light Exchange is they also have non-human speakers. So this is artist Avatar Laturbo Avedon and when she presented in uh, San Francisco last year in December. So let's get straight to issue one. This is what it looks like. Uh, they, Verdugo and Vargas kind of imagined it as a book as place and experiments, very non-conventional contributions, and wonderfully strange. I'd like to kind of describe it that way. And so here's the first uh, contribution I'll show. It's, the book is filled with them, but I wanted to show Christina Corfield, who is a scholar and artist based in, at UC Santa Cruz. She's a doctoral candidate in film and digital media, and she decided, well, uh, let me contribute a few pages and have people make their own magic lantern. Her research is based in older technologies and contemporaneously how would we be using them to retell stories. The next contribution to issue one is by Ingrid Rojas and her partner Jeremiah Barber. Um, I'm actually going to show you a video. It's pretty difficult to uh, explain. I, I could, but I only have 20 minutes, so I'm just going to show you a video and pardon. Oh, the brightness actually works. So you can kind of see um, what their, what their contribution to the issue one looks like. And you have to synchronize and load and synchronize two smartphones in order to really fully engage. Invisible. How am I supposed to call you? I'll call you. Hello. Hello. connect privately with each other. And unfortunately, you have to, there is no full length video of this piece. You actually have to have the book. Uh, it is a limited edition of 150 uh, and you, you have to really, I mean, you could technically look at the videos and synchronize them, but there's, there's something magical that happens with the book when you have the book itself as kind of a medium for the performance, I guess you can call it. So the, this last project I'm going to present on is by Kate Durbin, Amarath Barsuk, and Ian Hatcher. Durbin and Barsuk are poets, writers, and Hatcher is the developer that, uh, you know, um, that they worked with to bring Abra into, you know, into, re into a reality. And, uh, I apologize for the dark um, screenshots. I didn't realize how dark it would be, but it is an application that can be accessed through your through, uh, through device, your mobile device, and it is free, so I wanted to point that out as well. But Abra's vocabulary is built up over time. So like a chat, box, chat bot, it transmutates text based on the frequency of use. And the text you see here is the first poem you see when you open the app. And it's important, uh, another important aspect to point out is all of the text in Abra actually is uh, Durbin and Barsuk's poetry inter intermingled. And again, I apologize for this, at the top you should be able to see, and hopefully if you want to play around with it, I'd suggest downloading it. You can see uh, users can mutate, graft, prune, erase, cadabra, and share their poetry and writing with the world through Abra, uh, or not. 
I think that's the beauty of maximizing the use of such a tool. The work can be as public or as private as the writer wants it to be. So in a world that's so hell-bent on documenting everything, there's something beautiful and sublime about seeing one's writing changing faintly and looping emojis uh, as a way of both coding and codifying language. And again, this is the last of the, of the screenshots, but um, I just to add, the process of discovery uh, with one's writing by tapping and touching becomes a form of meta writing and creation, I'd like to argue with Abra. And it's one and one or more people can start to create language and meaning all on their own through the app, uh, from form to content the app allows for mobile technology to become, um, you know, just kind of this different iteration and of, of, of their work. So you can see, uh, and I, I did want to include an actual physical iteration or a physical kind of mutation of Abra. Um, I think uh, Bars Barsuk and Durbin really wanted the app to kind of inspire actual physical, creation of physical books. And so this hardcover limited edition is by Amy Rabbis at the Center for the Book and Paper Arts at Columbia College Chicago. And it's essentially invites readers to see the page itself as an interface. Uh, there is heat-sensitive heat ink. I will say, though, as much as I, I really enjoyed looking at the book, the heat-sensitive pages, I, I, if I rubbed my finger in my hands, it didn't work. I actually took a blow dryer to it and, and huffed on it, and that's what makes it work, which is still magical, albeit magical. But uh, I, I, you know, I just kind of throw it out there. It doesn't take, it doesn't devalue any, the, the book or the quality, but for me, it was a really interesting experience to try to play around with the book in that sense. And I really, I think for me, when I was researching Abra and I read a really in-depth paper written by the collective or written by Durbin Barsuk and Hatcher, you know, one of the extraordinary and striking aspects of the project is how Durbin and Barsuk envision if Abra, have an, if Abra had an avatar and make it, you know, like a human formation of Abra. And so the collective reminds us, and I think this sums it up beautifully, Abra, quote, Abra sprung not fully formed, but fully forming, from the minds of two poets who wanted to braid their aesthetics and poetics, one language-centric, concerned with words, slipperiness, and mutability, and the other richly and erotically corporeal, concerned with feminist representation and pop culture. So when thinking about Barsuk and Durbin's creation of Abra's avatar, you know, I really saw this as an entanglement of bodies and intertwined poetics that symbolize Abra as this post-human prophet as uh, Borsuk and Durbin have, have kind of uh, explicated over time. That's what they hoped Abra would be uh, and become for people. So the representations of Abra's avatars as conjoined twins show the potential of Abra as a catalyst for performative work. And that being said, and we can get straight to q and I guess, thank you. Sorry.